as a young citizen of india as a as a young citizen of india armed with technology knowledge and love for my nation with a vision of transforming india into a developed nation i am joining shobhit university what about you very good morning to all the participants from india and abroad shobhit institute of engineering and technology meerut a nac accredited with a grade deemed to be university and its centers of excellence center for informatics development solutions and application and center for industry 4.0 technology studies and application in association with african asian rural development organization ardo new delhi organize this weekly international webinar series on open source digital technologies towards self reliant india atmanirbhar bharat and this is the 113th edition of the webinar series on a very important topic smart rain fund farming pathway for prosperity a rural renaissance model from the donavur fellowship tenalveli district is a very important fellowship more than 123 years old today is 25th november 2023 we organize this webinar on every saturday at 11:30 am on behalf of the honorable chancellor his excellency the secretary general ardo honorable vice chancellor the faculty members of the university and on my behalf and as professor emeritus and chairman of centers of excellence center for agricultural informatics e government research studies and center for agri business and disaster management studies center for informatics development solutions and application and center for industry 4.0 technology studies and applications we welcome our guest speaker of the today's webinar honorable dr zaramia rajaneshan he is the chief executive officer of the donavur fellowship tenalveli district tamil nadu i wish to inform the participants and the speaker that the university regularly conducts two webinar series namely national webinar series on doubling farmers income by 2022 atmanirbhar bharat in agriculture and every thursday by last week we have completed about 124 editions and then international webinar series on open source digital technology towards self reliant india atmanirbhar bharat on every saturday under this webinar these two centers of excellence center for informatics development solutions and applications and center for industry 4.0 technology studies and application have organized 112 lectures so far on various topics which can generate lot of interest of the engineering graduates and post graduate students of other discipline to establish agri tech startup in every gram panchayat since it is very long list i will list out some of the few topics which may be of interest to the audience open technology to provision simple and economical it infrastructure there was a first lecture initial started on 12th september 2020 during the covid situation open data platform for smart digital government open source software in industrial iot for smes we have 63 million smes in the country this university has established a center for industry 4.0 technology studies and application to bring in digitalization of the small and msmes in the country technology imperatives make in india for self reliance ensuring food safety <clears throat> and compliance through technology technology investment in agriculture value chain role of foreign direct investment entrepreneurship and skill develop, uh, development ai design pathways era of automation industrial robotics and industry 4.0 indo german perspective of technology transfer skill gap analysis and opportunities role of artificial intelligence in healthcare current developments in diagnosis and vaccine research health informatics network value chain a he health system and beyond here we look into human health plant health animal health soil health water health fish health and environmental health as of now everything is a vertical it is a trillion dollar data economy 
computer science students, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, and um, data analytics can bring in very innovative, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, algorithm to ensure optimal nutrition in the soil and harvested food to minimize human disease. If that is the case, then in the in the for you know any COVID situation hereafter, we need not go for national lockdown. And building public digital platform using microservices and APIs. Health network informatics network value chain. It is very important. Health AI, clinical AI. Primary health center should be the center for recovery of you know discovery of disease. And this clinical artificial intelligence is an interface between machine learning and health informatics. And this is very important. We have more than 30,000 primary health centers human health centers and more than 43,000 animal primary health centers needs clinical AI package. Open source GovTech startups empowering growth and automation, enabling technologies for future vision, accelerate and scale non-linear growth through partner ecosystems, pharma 4.0, industry 4.0 applications to pharmaceutical manufacturing, path to digital transformation. Society 5.0, a new society beyond industry 4.0 and post-COVID-19. Smart village, community, African ICT, IoT lesson. Digital economy, ways and means to protect and empower for self-reliance. Transforming India through relevant education and, and vocational training. Smart microeconomic zone, how to convert every village as a self-reliance village. That is establishing smart microeconomic zone. Millet value chain from IoT to blockchain, a traceability roadmap. Market-driven agriculture, need for development of crop specific strategies at block level. Developing rural entrepreneurship to ensure doubling of farmers' income. Agronomy plus AI is equal to precision farming. Agronomy plus AI equal to precision farming. AI and metaverse, frontiers in workspace, coconut value chain challenges, transforming into opportunities. Coffee informatics value chain, facilitating smallholder coffee farmers into business. Data mining on digital agriculture, drone, eco eco drone technology ecosystems, empowering smallholder farmers in India, fisheries informatics network value chain, making urbanization work for the poor through new technologies, strategy for total development of local area, digital economy, ways and means to protect and empower for self-reliance, sustainable framework and standards for agriculture commodity, global experience, organic and natural farming, certification and way forward, transformation through technology, pathway for industries to embrace digital operation and knowledge transformation for participating in global value chain, regeneration and acceleration of agribusiness through digital transformation, Kisan GPT to Bharat, Bharat GPT, a AI-driven transformation of India led by agricultural information service, accelerating digital adoption and data-driven, a rural cloud initiative, smart tribal farming, digitalized grassland husbandry to empower Kujar and Bagarwal nomadic tribes of Jammu and Kashmir, systemic model of entrepreneurship, connecting dreams, sustainable solutions, and changing lives localization of sustainable development goals. Today is the 113th edition of this very important webinar series. We will have the talk by Dr. Mr. D.R. Jeremiah Rajanation, Chief Executive Officer, the Donor Fellowship, on a very important topic, Small Rainford Farming Pathway for Prosperity, Rural Renaissance Model from the Donor Fellowship, Tirnelveli District. 
India is said to be a land of villages. Acharya Vinoba Bhave said, India is largely an agriculture country, Krishi Pradhan Desh, and a country of villages, 6.5 lakh villages. Agriculture sector is the foundation of Indian economy. And it employs more than 50% of the India's workforce and contributes almost 20% of the GDP. And climate change has both the direct and indirect effects on agriculture productivity, including changing rainfall patterns, severe drought, flooding and changes in the geographical redistribution of pests and diseases. And Indian, India has got 14.5 crore operational holdings of which 85% of farmers are small and marginal size operational holders. Farmers of India are facing multidimensional problems, price fluctuation, debt and lack of infrastructure and weather. Indian far and farmer needs timely, location specific and personalized information for effective control on their production, risk and then market their produce to identify market opportunities. I would like to quote Honorable Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi at the 7th Governing Council meeting of Niti Ayok Team India meeting held on 7th August 2022, New Delhi. In his opening address, he stressed, I quote, the need to focus on modernized agriculture, animal husbandry, and food processing to become self-sufficient and global leader in the agriculture. And we will be having today talk on these lines. And, and in the in closing remarks, he said that, I quote, each state should focus on promoting trade, tourism, and technology via every Indian mission and around the world. The states must focus on reducing imports, increasing exports, and identifying opportunities thereof. I would like to quote the reforms under, being undertaken in India through digitalization of agricultural systems. I would like to quote some recommendation from the Doubling Farmers Income by 2022 Report 2018. It is popularly known as Dr. Ashok Dalwai Committee Report. I was closely associated during the formulation of this report as a group leader for two volumes, Volume 11 and Volume 12B. Volume 11 is empowering the farmers through extension and knowledge dissemination. And Volume 12B is digital technology and agriculture. This volume 11, 12 technology in agriculture brings in a connected dots from 1987 onwards where, in, where I was the project director for 512 districts computerization in the country. And 95, I initiated a national conference on informatics for sustainable agriculture development, which brought out IT blueprint for agricultural systems, which demanded 3 to 6 percent of the agriculture budget for IT in agriculture. And many IT programs in India were due to this recommendation of the National Conference on Sustainable Agriculture Development. And, and this report, Digital Technology in Agriculture, gives us seven mission mode programs. And this has to be operationalized. This will bring in one agri-tech startup in every gram panchayat. It means 2.5 lakh Agri-tech startups can be operationalized in the country to help 14.5 crores operational holders. Let me read out digital technology, digital agriculture, digital transformation and innovation in agriculture, digital India, make in India, skill India, startup India program for transformational reforms in agriculture sector through smart irrigated farming, smart rain fed farming and smart tribal farming. And digitalized agromet advisories and agricultural risk management solutions, digitalized agricultural resources information system, and micro level planning for achieving smart village and smart farming, digitalized agriculture value chain for 400 agriculture commodities, digitalized access to inputs, technology, knowledge, skill, agricultural finance, credit, marketing, and agribusiness management to farmers, means farming as a service and digitalized integrated land and water management system to achieve per drop more crop and digitalized farm health management for reduction of farmers loss. These are all the seven mission board programs I was instrumental to propagate through this, you know, doubling farmers income by 2022. After submission, 
I started this main course of conducting national webinars and international webinars to propagate digital technology in agriculture systems. That, and and we also have Atmanirbar Bharat. It is the road ahead. It is the vision of our honorable prime minister to make India self-reliant based on five eyes: intent, inclusion, investment, infrastructure, innovation, and based on five pillars: economy, quantum jump. Infrastructure, one that represents modern India, systems 21st century technology driven, vibrant demography, rural youths and urban youths, and demand whereby the strength of our demand and supply chain should be utilized to full capacity. We have Digital India program, which, is, which aims to transform India into a knowledge-based economy and a digitalized empowered society. And we have Digital India is having nine pillars of growth uh, nine growth areas and according to nascom india's it sector seems to become a us dollar 227 billion industry in financial year 2022 registering 15.5% growth rate which is the highest in over in you know, a decade and on february 20th 2019 ministry of electronics and information technology published a report titled India's Trillion Dollar Digital Economy, which talks about 30 digital themes, if scaled up nationally, can accelerate India in nine key areas. We have platform economy in the digital world, and the digital ecosystems are essential for digital transformation in the digital world. We have seen green revolution since 1960. Under the chairmanship of you know, Professor M. S. Swaminathan, who has recently passed away, I have been closely associated with him since 1990. And now we are witnessing another green revolution. This green revolution is G R I N, G R I N, G for genomics, R for robotics, I for informatics, and N for nanotechnology. It means that all engineering students. And uh, all postgraduate students of uh, 1,500 deemed to be university and 4,500 engineering colleges and all engineering, all schools which teach botany, by zoology, geography, economics, computer science, mathematics, statistics can join. And we also have Amrit call led up to 100 by 2047. India is likely to become new India. And under like this smart rainfed farming, smart irrigated farming, smart tribal farming, the university has you know, initiated smart tribal farming initiative in a cluster of 10 to 15 tribal villages throughout the country. India has got 1,45,000 tribal villages. By 2047, in this 1,42,000 tribal villages also will be a modernized tribal villages. And we have 17 sustainable development goals and 169 go targets to be achieved digitalization of agriculture system will bring in achievement of many sustainable development goals to be achieved agroecological and sustainable agriculture is moving forward and smart farming is taking the grassroots level you know achievement and agriculture 4.0 is the future of farming technology and and uh, internet of things automation of skills and workforce, data-driven farming, and chatbots. And farms and agriculture operations will have to be run very differently, you know, due to advancement in technology such as sensors, devices, machines, and information technology. Future agriculture will use sophisticated technology such as robots, temperature and moisture sensors, aerial images, and GPS technology. These advanced devices in precision agriculture and robotic system will allow farms to be more profitable, efficient, safe, and environment friendly. Agriculture's connected future. How technology can yield new growth? Challenges the industry facing is thus twofold. Infrastructure must be developed to enable the use of connectivity in farming. And where connectivity already exists, strong business cases must be made in order for solutions to be adopted. There are two issues which has to look into it. Ecosystems, we have digital for India, make in India, startup India, stand up India, Atmanirbar Bharat, 
2020 and connectivity mission 2020 2022 as per bharat net connectivity every gram panchayat is supposed to get one gpps internet connectivity recently i saw the announcement by honorable it minister of tamil nadu government he said that by next year all the gram panchayat will have bharat net connectivity and we also from the bharat net connectivity you have another technology to provide high speed internet connectivity through wifi hotspot that is pm wani prime minister's wifi access network interface a technology developed by c dot and which will bring in many kind of you know village e-commerce a reality and this also will bring in operationalization of msme schemes in agriculture and this university by associating with many ngos we are involved in bringing in digitalized agriculture commodity value chain we are working on fisheries informatics network value chain health informatics network value chain one district one product informatics network value chain spices informatics network value chain banana informatics network value chain paddy informatics network value chain millet informatics well network value chain neem product informatics network value chain landana camera informatics network value chain and jagri informatics network value chain and so on so forth small enterprises in agriculture and micro enterprises in agriculture includes farmers farmer produce organization cooperative societies self help group traders aggregators and retailers out of 63 million smes it is estimated that about 3 million smes are in agriculture sector and uh, you know we we uh, you know and uh, partnering to broaden rural broadband access and create high value services will bring in digitalized agriculture in india and we need to establish agri tech startup in at the gram panchayat level and uh, we have the f- established farm extension 4.0 today we have only 1 kvk per district but we would like to establish agri tech startup in every gram panchayat to help you know small and marginal farmers to provide agro climatic advisory good agriculture practices financial insur- insur- and insurance inclusion agriculture marketing non farm activities farm planning micro level planning agro warehousing farm extension inputs dealers networking irrigation extension research extension and and um, agriculture technology management text you know uh, services livestock extension and fisheries extension smart rainfed farming facilitating digital transformation to unlock opportunities in rainfed areas in india smart rainfed farming is a new technology destination for undertaking to unblock unlock opportunities in rainfed area today is the second talk on this topic first topic first talk was given by the director of the grayland you know the central grayland research institute hyderabad and india aims to become 5 trillion dollar economy by 2025 and 10 trillion dollar economy by 2030 so rural india is a powerhouse with a potential to add 1.8 trillion dollars are equivalent that of gdp's 2012 to the country's economy the potential could be realized only if bharat and india merges and sustainable development goals you know of united nation 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty protect the planet and ensure that by 2030 all the people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2050 and since 2010 global total factor productivity growth has been increasing only by 1.5% against 1.75% the required required average annual rate to double agriculture productivity so you know it it it, it means that if this trend continues the farmers in in low income countries will use more inputs and resources to get higher outputs <coughs> disrupting natural resources basis and therefore recommend strategic policy goals for a sustainable productivity world among the others that is adopt science based and information technologies and invest in agriculture research rainford eco agri system it's which has all capabilities which we needed to unlock its potential 
Rainford agriculture occupies 51% of country's net zone area. 51% of country's network, network, you know, net zone area. Accounts for nearly 40% of the total food production. It is highly diverse and risk prone, characterized by low levels of productivity and input usage coupled with vagary monsoon emanating from climate change, resulting in wide variation and instability in crop yields. Realizing, revitalizing Rainford Agriculture Network of Civil Society Organization, researchers, practitioners, and policy makers is required to establish productive and resilient rainford agriculture according to the you know, input available in the National Rainford Area Authority website. National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture. Operational Guidance 2014 talks about rainford area development. Pradhan Mandri Krishi Sinja Yojana. The rainford area development authority will adopt an area based on approach for development and conservation of natural resources along with the farming systems. This component has been formulated in a watershed plus framework. Watershed plus framework. India has got 35 six river resource basin, 35 basins, 112 catchments, 550 subcatchments, and 3,237 watersheds. And then mini watersheds and micro watershed. Watershed is a trusted tool for overall, overall development of a village and people living within the area. Agriculture 4.0 is the future of farming technology. We have to adopt a digital transformation in agriculture. Horizontal, you know, it, it, is, it is digital research and in, you know, innovation in agriculture, in institutions, and digital capacity and deployment in agriculture and farm level. These two approach, we have to take it for smart rainfall farming. And I'm very happy to inform that Mr. Uh, today's guest speaker, Zaramiya Rajanation, is, is, is the CEO of the Donor Fellowship. It is a Christian organization that works towards holistic development, running projects across different areas of child development, education, health care, and community development and conservation of nature. And he will talk about soil conservation, rainwater harvesting, sustainable agriculture, and flora fauna conservation and mitigating carbon footprint. Now turn to the address by Mr. Dr. Jeremiah Rajanation, Chief Executive Officer, the Donor Fellowship, Tunnel Valley District, Tunnel Valley, Tamil Nadu. This today's topic will motivate and galvanize the participants watching over telecast through Facebook.com, Oblique Soviet University, India, YouTube.com, Oblique Soviet University, in or LinkedIn.com, Oblique Company, Oblique Soviet Dash University for establishing. Startups, physical, physical plus digital infrastructure on smart rainfall farming in association with Donor Fellowship, facilitating agriculture and rural transformation in India. Let us unlock the opportunities in rural India at the earliest. Secret to doubling the income of the farmers lies in the efficiency. Let me introduce our guest speaker to the audience. Mr. Manish. Mr. Manish. Mr. D.R. Jeremia Rajanation is the Chief Executive Officer of Donauer Fellowship since 1996. The Donauer Fellowship is a Christian organization that works towards holistic development, running projects across different areas of child development, education, health care, community development, and conservation of nature. Founded in 1901, by Ami Karmakail, fondly known as Amma, as a home for rescued children. The work of the fellowship has, through the years, expanded to all its current facets. The following environmental projects have been pioneered and executed during the tenure of Mr. D. R. Jeremiah Rajanation. Soil conservation, a practice of preserving native wild grass cover, leaf litter, mulch and avoiding the process of deep plowing is followed to allow for the biodiversity of subsoil organisms to flourish. This in turn has improved the soil health and has kept soil erosion in check in the campus since the late 1990s. Rainwater harvesting, 
started starting in 1997. A system was designed unique to the local terrain. The roads were raised in the entire 170-acre campus to collect rainwater and divert those using subterrane pipes to surface wells. These depleted groundwater levels as a result have risen to risen from 19 feet to 20-30 feet since. Sustainable agriculture, a rigorous usage of open wells is followed and bore wells beyond 100 feet were avoided towards sustainable water practices. Seasonal and local food crops have been adopted into the diet, uh, into the diet of campus to allow for healthier, sustainable practices and support climate resilient organic farming. Flora of fauna conservation along with an intense afforestation in the campus using native flora and arbitrium uh, arbortum was started in 2000 to serve as a seed bank for posterity. Mitigating carbon footprint, living and uh, cons uh, you know, construction, a simple lifestyle amalg amalgamated with the motto, reduce, reuse and recycle has been strictly advocated on the campus. The maximum utility of salvaged materials and the use of renewable native hard wood trees like wahai, puvarasu, neem, etc. have been promoted while sternly avoiding monoculture. Mr. Jeremiah Rajanation did his B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering in 1989 and his hobbies include weather forecasting, music and mountaineering. With this, I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. D.R. Jeremiah Rajanation, CEO, to the International Webinar Series on Open Source Digital Technology for Self-Reliant India, Atmanimra Brother, to talk on Smart Rainford Farming, Pathway for Prosperity, a Rural Renaissance Model from the Donauer Fellowship, Tunnel Valley District. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. I wish to extend my thanks to all the uh, people who are who have arranged for this uh, important meeting, and especially I thank the key people in your university and Professor Moni especially for arranging this uh, meeting. So I am really privileged to be part of this uh, wonderful project. So, in fact, uh, Professor has uh, given the context very clearly and very lucidly. So it's very easy for me to continue now. First, I will briefly tell about our organization. The organization was started in 1901 and it works mostly uh, in child and women empowerment and also agriculture and sustainable rural livelihoods. So uh, from uh, 1901 onwards, to nearly 123 years, uh, we have been serving in the rural areas and we still have a lot of vision and mission to serve the rural areas only. So, and when the organization was started in 1901, the scenario was different. The poverty was everywhere and uh, gender and other discrimination was there. But now the things have changed. After independence, there has been a lot of improvement. And now the needs are totally changed. So we are also revisiting our vision. So how we can serve our rural communities better. So that's why now we are giving more thrust to agriculture, sustainable rural livelihoods. So can we go to the next slide? You are Mr. Yeah, Manish. Okay. Or? Yeah. Yes. So just click on the screen, the next slide will come, sir. Yeah, yes. Okay. So I would like to briefly uh, give the backdrop how, uh, how uh, we work. That is our philosophy, our guiding philosophy, so that you will clearly understand what motivates us to do what we do, why we do what we do. So, so we believe that the divine mystery, the God, is our family in all cultures and which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and openness to the forces, forces which create an uphold life. So we believe that the force which creates and sustains our life, it is very sacred. And our founder, she... Uh, she, had, she's a, she was a great poet. She had written hundreds of poetry and uh, she encouraged all the children, all whoever was benefited through our organization to have the same worldview that we have to see God through his creation and we have to respect it 
and uh, we have to be we have to have a very reverential gratitude attitude towards the natural resources so this is one way of putting it so, <coughs> renewal of the spirit and openness to the forces which create and uphold life so this is how we view the uh, big big questions of life and when it comes to human societies how we govern ourselves and in what context we are helping the human society this is one of our guiding philosophy we would like to promote justice equity and compassion in human relations when we try to help the needy we see god's love in action so instead of preaching we try to do everything by action so whether it is an environmental disaster or a health emergency or people who are need in uh, who are in need of education or who are oppressed who need uplifting and empowering see we like to show the compassion in human relations and this is one of the key aspects of our organization it's called reverence for life so we respect the interdependent web of all existence of which we are also a part so from the tiniest of bacteria to the largest living animals i think we are a part of the same life web so our founder has uh, written so much about this and actually she comes from the tradition st francis of assisi so who who also advised his disciples to see god through all these uh, living forms so in our campus you will see that we don't even uproot the grasses because we value it we revere all living organisms we value all life forms including uh, the microorganisms also so respect for all interdependent web of all existence is our guiding philosophy this will be reflecting in our sustainable practices also and uh, when emi kamikal started the home for the orphans the children and the women as the numbers grew they 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 had to be fed so agriculture lands were bought and agriculture was started so they did not try to bring some alien system but they tried to study our local indian time tested systems and they followed it i i think most of you would have seen the agri the read that agriculture testament by sir albert howard so in that he has documented the best practices of our ancestors so in donavur also Uh, we have uh, followed the same pattern we have tried to use our local seeds our local methods as far as possible we never try to just copy and paste the western technology all these years so and we always uh, celebrate the sacred circle of life and we also try to learn from the earth center tribal traditions and the local traditions where they valued everything and where they viewed everything with gratitude nothing was taken for granted so we we have the culture in our organization and uh, i i would like to tell you uh, when uh, professor was telling about the challenges we are facing now i will uh, uh, briefly tell you about the challenges we face in our block level that is we are in the block called kalakkad so when i actually basically i am a mechanical engineer but when i joined back the, joined back the organization the agriculture was in shambles so people were just trying to follow the industrial agricultural methods and they didn't have any mentors and the green revolution it was going in different directions so we could see that uh, the, the whole landscape was becoming desolate so i think in the late 90s there were in the 70s and 80s there were a lot of drought years because of very poor rainfall the farmers had to dig in more bore wells they went deeper and deeper and once they have emptied the permanent aquifers they had to abandon the land and the most important thing was the inputs for the farms instead of sourcing the inputs in the local area it was all bought from some other areas like chemicals and other expensive inputs 
and it was just like uh, the mindset was like a typical modern agriculture like a factory you feed the input and it goes through a process and that you get the output but uh, but it doesn't work that way it is not that simple in agriculture so here you can see that how the modern agriculture uh, is going towards unsustainable uh, scenarios so i think most of you will understand so the when you after the process is over the amount of soil erosion and pesticide built up is so huge that uh, the, the people who face the brunt of the situation are again the rural people and the marginalized that's the irony of this thing so our in our block also we were facing maybe not up to the scale but because of the wrong choice of the crops and because of uh, unsustainable practices there have been lot of other challenges so this was just like an extraction industry people buy a plot of land and they do maximum extraction then they after the soil is soil has become unresponsive then they give it to some real estate and uh, then that's how we have been losing the real arable land for a very long time so so we wanted to make a u turn and because we know that this is very dangerous path which our rural folk were taking so that was also making lot of our rural youth to lose interest in agriculture and people who started migrating to us chennai for it jobs and other jobs so and it was very difficult to get farm hands also so actually it's a very complex uh, uh, amount very complex reasoning is behind this so there are so many things uh, involved in this uh, unsustainable agriculture not only the uh, uh, un uncontrollable extraction of resources but when you come to the uh, marketing side that bottleneck was also that the farmers were at the hand of the middlemen for example if we take banana our kalakkad is very famous for banana we spend nearly 11 to 12 months for uh, taking care of a banana plant then we take it to the nearby market kerala or nagarkoil then we give it to a middleman so he we sell it for some we get maybe some 10 or 20% profit in that but the man who buys it from us and he then he again sells it to a retailer he keeps it only for maybe one night or two nights but he gets the same 20% to 30% so sometimes we don't even get the 20 10% so so not only the natural resources extraction but also the marketing was also it is uh, it is also a bottleneck so there are so many factors which contributed to the unsustainable practices of uh, agriculture so the youth have lost interest in agriculture and at the same time uh, the real estate boom and the land mafia they were all already looking for land <laughs> which they can easily convert into uh, some real estate plots so this is not going to work forever so like uh, professor was telling in his initial address we also wanted to help the society to reverse the situation that's how then uh, we have uh, started deeply analyzing what what is really the problem then uh, we started uh, using this concept regenerative agriculture we wanted to minimize farm inputs from outside and we wanted to give a local solution to a global problem because this has been happening in many many areas and many rural communities were losing their livelihoods so gradually we started uh, doing regenerative agriculture actually instead of going against the natural mechanisms or the forces of nature we wanted to study nature closely and try to flow along with the natural processes so and take maximum regenerative uh, potential from the resources for example if you get sick in many uh, actually world health organization they suggest that uh, antibiotic should be the last resort but in many places in india we see immediately everybody goes for antibiotic and that causes superbugs to proliferate so actually we have to rely on the regenerative uh, immunity system of our own body so this is the same thing happens to our soil also so we try to 
give the soil the necessary time, the necessary resources so that it can regenerate itself. So this is what basically we tried all these years. And at the same time, the social and cultural value is also very, very important. So if everybody leaves the villages and go to the cities, what will happen to the rural areas? Now, the India wants to be self-reliant and we wish that all the gram panjais have to do climate resilient agriculture. Without people, what would we do? So we want to connect people and community with the land again, so that uh, the doing agriculture is also a very lucrative and very rewarding uh, field for the upcoming future generation. This is one of our main aims, and we have been doing this for the past 20 years. So how do we transition from this unsustainable practices to a regenerative system? So we use the natural process, the, the potential in the natural forces to transform and regenerate, to study it closely and use that force to transform the local agriculture and support the local communities. So, so this is one of the main choices we have to make. Either we do regenerative processes, but when we do regenerative agriculture, we cannot do everything like our mind dictates. We have to have a mindset which should, we have to be totally aware of the natural processes. We have to be aware of the climate. We have to be aware of the limitation of natural resources. We cannot have unlimited growth. We cannot have greed. So we have to bend our will and we have to keep our attitude in alignment with nature. So that's what I mean by bending. So, but if, if we say, no, 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 I will just rely on technology, but uh, I want to get the maximum, maximum out of my land. And if it is not sustainable, then I think somewhere along the line, that chain will break. So we have to make a clear choice in which path we are going to do. So we have to make use of the best available technology, like Professor was saying, the latest technology in informatics, in satellite data, in robotics, and in everything we have to do. But our philosophy and our aim should not be greed. And we should respect the forces of nature. We, should, we are in a world of finite resources. There are some infinite things like solar energy, but as far as soil, water, rainfall, everything is concerned, God has given for each area, each climate zones, some finite amount every year. So we have to work within that area because we have God has given us brains also. So if we want to go beyond that, I think we'll cross the threshold and then unsustainable practices will come in. So maybe technology can give us some temporary solution, but in the long term, as we see now, Again, the rural community only will suffer. So we have to make this definitive choice somewhere on, on the line. So this is just to demonstrate uh, uh, the sustainable practices which we use and the minimum use of uh, uh, chemicals or antibiotics, whether in animal husbandry or in agriculture, and uh, to depend on the natural mechanisms to revitalize the soil. So, and uh, in our experience, we have seen that uh, monoculture or uh, doing uh, only one crop, suppose if we are expecting paddy or banana, if I convert all my land to banana and paddy, it doesn't work. So, and also without animals, we cannot have a very healthy relationship with the soil. So we need different components from the tiny bacteria to the grasses, to the shrubs, and to the annuals and to the agroforestry trees. We also need uh, animals like goats, cows, and we also need humans because we are all part of this same ecosystem. So we have to have a holistic approach in each rural setup. So, but when we compartmentalize and we try to uh, grow, maybe you do this much area, this plant, I will do this like that. Maybe it may work, but uh, on a long-term basis, 
everything has to be planned in a block level to use the maximum potential of that, that particular ecosystem. So we have found out the hard way that the truth of this, because we have tried initially tried some monoculture plants, but uh, it was a failure. And uh, now, as much as possible, we are trying to have uh, diverse plants in our agriculture system. And one of the main other component is the plants suitable to our particular agroclimatic landscape. Our ancient Tamils have classified our lands into five zones. Kurinchi, Mullai, Marudam, Naidal, Pale. So we in Donavur, which in the Kalakad block, that falls into that Mullai landscape. It's on the edge of the forested land. It is on the foothills of the mountains. Most of it is pasture land, scrub jungle. But when you come to Thirnal Valley, some 45, 50 kilometers, it is a Marudam landscape because there is a perennial river going on there. But as you know, humans always try to climb the social ladder. Whenever they go to uh, visit those large towns in their, uh, on the riverside, those people have these uh, paddy fields and bananas. The, the people from our Mullay landscape, thousands, yeah, thousands of years back, they would have tried to emulate that. So gradually, those plants from those areas have started creeping in and are coming uh, to dominate our landscape. And it was OK, but uh, after the Industrial Revolution, when people totally tried to change the crop pattern and when they try to change this classification of landscape, unsustainability is the issue. So that also we have learned the hard way through. In fact, initially we have planted a lot of banana and other things, all these water intensive crops. Then we realized the, the importance of rain fed farming. Where we are, why this, uh, all these lakes are there? Who built all these contour buns, contour lakes, hundreds of years back, thousands of years back? So how they have done the agriculture. So we had to go back to the history, the Nayak period, the Pandya period, even the Sangam literature. When we studied the food pattern, it is totally different. The people in the riverine civilization, they had a different kind of agriculture. They had a different kind of lifestyle. But but the people in the Mullay landscape, they had different uh, kind of uh, food pattern, diet, everything. We, we, we cannot go back to those levels, but when you are going to get something out of the land, you have to take care, you have to, this is a very important factor. What you grow sustainably entirely depends on where you are. So we are in a Mullay landscape as far as Donavur is concerned. So gradually we started moving towards that, local and uh, seasonal plants. Then we realized if there is nobody to consume what we produce, what will happen? <laughs> so then we had to inculcate, we have to inculcate the habit of consuming local and seasonal food to our people. But at the same time, we realized people are going entirely in the wrong direction. Millets were not being used, the local uh, greens and vegetables. It is all being substituted by potato and other vegetables grown in Uti or other places. So everything was changing. But recently, I have heard the central government is very keen that they are encouraging people to source their food from a particular radius. So we know the importance of local and seasonal food eating habits. If people are made aware of this and if they are trying to consume what is grown locally, what is grown in season, then I think each rural area will definitely thrive. The excess can be processed and exported. But but if you want to eat what is not seasonal and if you want, uh, then we will be giving more and more burden to our Mother Earth, which is not sustainable. So I think this has to start from uh, right from the school. For example, in our community, we have an orphanage, we have children home, we have elderly home. So we used to have uh, seasonal diets some 30, 40 years back. But now I can see People want tomato throughout the year. 12 months, they want tomatoes. So <laughs> 12 months, they want to eat rice. But in those days, we didn't have. We ate uh, millets and we ate uh, greens like kirai in certain parts of the months. So now, 
in as far as what uh, as an organization we can do something to have a positive impact so we are planning to start a small cafeteria in our area to serve local and seasonal food we are also trying to promote this diet amongst our uh, children and our uh, school children so and our cropping pattern is also slowly moving towards local and seasonal plants so this will keep the ecosystem in good health uh, this will have a long term sustainability in whatever part of the earth you are so this is and we also run a dairy farm we have around 50 cows and we follow the same principle that reverence for life so we give the least pressure to the animals so we always try to see them contented so any visitors who comes to our farm they say cows they are just short of smiling they, they always say they are contented cows because even in the night we don't tie them into the sheds we always allow them to grow freely and they are free range actually for a free range product they say at least 200 days in a year an animal should go for uh, grazing but our animals go 365 days they go out every day and uh, we try to grow uh, the cattle fodder with uh, minimum chemical inputs with maximum organic inputs so that our uh, cows they have a very good uh, uh, food intake so and we also have a 24 cubic meters biogas plant through which we feed our kitchen common community kitchen and the slurry which comes out of the biogas plant we feed it to the vermicompost uh, to the earthworms then that vermicompost we use it to our fruit and vegetable gardens to our orchards and other things so the complete redistribute the livestock and manure nutrients it is fed to the biogas plant it is fed to the earthworms then again it is recycled to, the, to our uh, vegetable gardens so it's not only healthier food for humans it's also healthier food for our livestock that is that the practice we follow and uh, when we we grow some millets we grow seasonal varieties of paddy and we grow uh, papaya uh, local vegetables and uh, we are nearly a thousand strong community in our school nearly 650 children are studying in school and in our orphanage around 230 people are there so and with our staff everything our campus we have around 1000 people so whatever milk we are producing that is consumed by our own uh, community and the vegetables uh, millets and other products are consumed by our own people and we try to give the best food possible to our children because they already they come from very poor backgrounds they are coming from disadvantaged sections of the society the best we can give them in their childhood is the best possible organic food and the education and health care so that's why we invest them but in the long term so we want to raise some funding also out of this agriculture for that once only i was discussing with our professor how to increase our income so if we can produce some excess amount of all these products we can sell it to some outside market through that we can raise some money that again we can channel it back to our charitable activities if i want to educate 10 kids in a college in a year i need huge sum of money for that i i need some hard cash so so i need to have uh, some value added uh, products out of my either from a dairy farm or from my millets or from so that i can sell it to the open market with some of course with some premium sale with organic uh, product like that so that is the path we are looking at right now maybe through the help of uh, professor and other dignitaries i think we will move towards a direction in the near future so we want to raise healthy products for our local community and we we must encourage our uh, public whether it's rural or in our district to encourage through awareness programs running in schools and to various things we can do tele, uh, television ads to buy local food from local region to producers this awareness is very important so when we say doubling farmers income we have seen that if they can directly sell their product to the consumers i think their income will automatically the uh, increase so that part also has to be strengthened that chain has to be strengthened for that i think uh, there may be a lot of strategies i am not uh, very uh, aware of them but 
So to connect with local consumers, with local farmers, I think we can follow some good models. And apart from that, uh, we need some uh, technical guidance and uh, uh, maybe investments for local processing. For example, people who come and see, uh, uh, stay as guests in our campus, they, after tasting our milk, they say, because our cows, they graze wild grasses, native grasses, and the ghee, our sisters make it. It has got a very good, uh, unique flavor. They say this is a niche product. You can sell it if you can process it and bottle it in a particular way. And you have to do branding, positioning, a lot of things they say, which we are not aware. So this kind of capacity building, uh, our rural people need. So how to process our local food and how to uh, study the market and how to brand or position our products in the market. So these kind of things, I think uh, with the help of uh, people like you, we can uh, develop. So on the long term, raising healthy products, buying food from local producers and some value addition by local processing will definitely improve the income of local rural communities. And uh, this is a general thing. Uh, so actually we also practice uh, reduce, reuse, recycle. And our founder always say waste not, want not. So we, we, in, uh, we in nature, there is no nothing called waste. Everything is, if you go to a rainforest, you see nothing is called waste there. Everything is recycled. So we want to emulate that natural processes in regenerative agriculture. Recycling is very, very important. So if it is not uh, recyclable, then maybe we will have to segregate. Otherwise, whatever can be recycled, we want to find how it, can, it has to be recycled. It has to be segregated and it has to be recycled. And all the human food waste has to be composted. And the most important thing is reconnecting our next generation with the nature. That is very, very important. So. I think in school, actually, we are fortunate to have our own school. Nearly 600 children are studying. We have a green club, eco club. So we try to connect our children with nature from a very young age. We teach them how to identify migrant birds, how to identify native grasses, so how to uh, identify the cloud direction and the monsoon. So all these things we try to inculcate them from very early childhood so that they don't get disconnected with their natural surroundings. So I think in the rural areas, all the schools, everyone should uh, try to have at least this reconnect with nature in the schools. So that maybe down the line, maybe another 10 or 15 years, those youth will have more inclination to have more nature-centric approach to whatever they do. So, but in the schools, it, very sadly, this reconnecting with nature is not happening maybe once in a year or twice in a year they go for a tree planting or some eco drive or some cleaning some campus that's what is happening but they have to be uh, and they, they don't even know what's the direction east west in those days people from the rural area they never say left right they always say east west north south but now they present you they don't even know what's the direction so this disconnect with nature has to be reversed then I think we'll have some good future for our rural livelihoods in the future. So this has to be taken care of by rural schools. And from our experience, we can say that uh, soil is the base for everything. So if you take care of the soil, most of the things are taken care of by themselves. So human health, we give more nutrients, dense food, we get healthier people. When you have good, healthier people, then uh, the ecosystem is also very healthy. And as I said, uh, for global problems, we should have local solutions. We cannot be forever imagining that help will come from some imaginary god or some <laughs> imaginary savior. It's never going to happen. And it all you are also not disconnected with the global issues. We are all part of the same uh, life web. So what I can do in my village, what I can do in my block. So we have to have a similar interested group. We have to join together and we have to start doing these things. So 
ecosystem health, planetary health, everything is linked together. So uh, with the united uh, approach, we can definitely do this. And uh, this is a, mostly about rain-fed farming. I have actually, we have been collecting uh, rainfall data from the 1920s, but I have projected rainfall from 1940s onwards. On an average, we get around uh, 33 inches, around 8, 890 millimeters in Donabur, in our block. So some people say that in those days we had very good rain. They always say about the golden past. Now we don't have any rain like that. But our record shows it is not like that. But there are some changes in the pattern. Uh, so when we analyze that, the timing and the intensity, there are some serious concerns. So that's what we have seen. The total rainfall may be, it, it is not deviated much. But we have seen uh, the intensity of rain. Those days, those block inches, like any rainfall on a single day or above one inch, those incidences were very few, like 25 mm in one hour or 15 minutes, 20 minutes, intense rainfall. But now we are seeing that, uh, that frequency is increasing. We are seeing more intense rainfall. So that means if your soil is not protected, you are in for trouble. So that we are seeing in the past uh, 15 years. And another uh, and the top line is the rainfall in our forest. We, uh, I forgot to tell about the forest. We also have a 40 acre forest inside the Kalakad Mundandari Tiger Reserve that was bought in 1917 as a place for physical and spiritual rejuvenation. You just remember in the 1910-1920s, uh, planters were having a heyday in the hills. Everybody was converting rainforest into coffee, tea plantations. But at the time, our founder and those contemporaries bought this 40-acre coffee plantation and they reforested it. Can you imagine that? So they wanted the forest to take over. So in 2017, we celebrated the 100th anniversary for this conservation effort. When they announced the Kalakad Mundandari Tiger Reserve, government wanted to take over most of the private holdings. But when they came to see our uh, land, a high-level team from Delhi visited Donavur, then they went up to the forest. They said they have been practicing conservation for more than 100 years. This should be like a model for our forest department to follow. So let them keep it. So this is one prime example where we have worked along with nature. So any of you, if you want to visit, you, you are welcome. We will see how we have preserved nature for this. So there also we are we are having rainfall records for the past hundred years, nearly hundred years. There are so many variations there, but the, the one striking uh, trend is the ratio between the rainfall in the plains and in the western Ghats. We are just maybe as the crow flies, we are just maybe a five kilometers from the forest and on over. But the rainfall gradient is very steep. There we get around 120 inches. Here it is 30 inches, 3,000 millimeters and 800 millimeters. But during the monsoon, uh, northeast monsoon, normally if I get 25 mm here, it, uh, it rains nearly 70, 75 mm in the forest. But now we see there is more rain in the plains and proportionately it's not raining in the hills. So that means it affects the rain-fed uh, tanks. So in the past uh, past year, we had the same problem. Uh, actually, we have a field, uh, paddy field, 80 acres of paddy field in a place called Kamaneri. It is fed by a mountain stream. It is rain fed. Uh, there are no dams. Uh, there are no dams to regulate the water. So we totally depend on the northeast monsoon rainfall. In 2021, in the plains, we had excess rainfall. In fact, you won't believe... Uh, for our average 33 millimeters, we had 83 inches of rainfall, nearly three times more rainfall. But in the hills, it was not like that. And uh, the next year, uh, the lakes weren't filled up because there was not enough rain. Though the rainfall in the plains was enough, it was not that much in the uh, mountains. So we don't know whether it has something to do with the climate change or some wind patterns. That is one thing. Then the another thing we are seeing is there are more low pressure systems in the Arabian Sea now. When we were children, we used to see maybe if there are 10 systems in the Bay of Bengal, 
maybe one system in the Arabian Sea. Now there are they are equal during northeast monsoon, and that immediately takes the easterlies to the Arabian Sea. And uh, the, this trend we are witnessing in the past six or seven years now. This is one thing. And the next thing is southwest monsoon. Actually, we live in the rain shadow area. June, July, August, I think that's the monsoon for the whole of India. But for our dry Thirnal Valley district, we get only very dry, dusty winds and occasional drizzles if we are close to the Western Ghats. It is called Saral rains. You have beautiful climate in Kuttalam and some other areas. So actually the rains, they are supposed to commence in the last week of May in June. But for many years, we are seeing that initial spell, it is very, very weak. But the IMD announces southwest monsoon had set in. Uh, of course, the wind pattern has changed, everything has changed. But that the initial monsoon spell, normally in our gramam they say it has to, they call it partum in Tamil. Partum means at least two weeks you should have continuous rain in the mountains. Then only you get some water in the lakes. Through that you do your rain fed farming. But that initial spell, it's not happening, it's not right. But when you get to the close of the southwest monsoon season, in October, the total tally is right. What happens is in, towards the end of September, October, everything uh, rains in that uh, two, three weeks. So, but so the total, as far as statistics is concerned, everything is okay. That's what one professor said. We need block level, uh, time, uh, time bound prediction. That is very, very important. When you just predict it for season, sometimes it's not, it's of no use. So, even in a season, if you take May, the third week of May to September, southwest monsoon, we have we have to segregate into different periods. So each period we should have some focus, otherwise it's a waste. So so these kind of there are these kind of changes we are witnessing, but we need still in in lower in-depth analysis of the rainfall pattern. But we have all the records. I need some volunteers to come and uh, do the analysis for me so that they can we can find out more patterns which are emerging now. So, and these are decadal averages. So you can see there is not much variation in the average of uh, rainfall, except in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of uh, consecutive drought. So in, even in Donover, Kalakad area, the average had gone to even 637. Then again, it has shot up now. But in Donover, because of our afforestation and because of the green cover, we are with a little bit higher rainfall than the surrounding areas. So, but the effect of climate change, I think uh, we are seeing this kind of some uh, changes, but not in the total numbers of here. That's what I wanted to tell you. The total number of uh, the number of rainfall days and the total rainfall average, it's more or less the same, but the distribution and the intensity, there are some changes. And also the proportion between hills and the plains, that is also uh, there are some changes. So here also you can see. And uh, we are keeping the rainfall record from 1927. And Donover has recorded the highest ever in 2021. Here you can see that here. 2021. And 2022 we have crossed our average. But there was no water in any of the lakes. So we could not do paddy. Actually, rainfall was more than our average, but because of the untimely rainfall, there was no water in the lakes and not enough water in the mountains. So these are all real challenges for rain-fed farming. So in our area, we don't need one direct trend. We also depend on lakes, which are fed by mountain streams. So, so we have to be very adaptive to these changes. So... Uh, actually, here we are preparing uh, soil for sowing the millets. And this is our common area field. So, so we grow paddy only for uh, one season a year. And if the northeast monsoon is good, that we normally we uh, know only towards the end of the monsoon. So sometimes after investing, we lose. But sometimes we uh, get it through. And but uh, after the paddy season is over, normally we plant uh, kambu or ragi. And uh, kambu, uh, pearl millet, uh, we, we were unable to protect it from birds. 
But ragi, I think we have sort of succeeded. So we have been doing that regularly. And finger millet, uh, we grow it organically. And our sisters grind it as a flower and we pack it into half kg packets. And we also sell it in local outlets, for organic flour. So it is highly sought after from our area. So finger millet, we are doing regularly. And this is our dairy farm. And uh, they are uh, uh, they are not artificially inseminated. We have we grow our own uh, stud bull, and they are allowed to copulate naturally. And now we have some mixed uh, breeds because you can see some HF uh, mixed breed and some Sindhi and Jersey cross here. But right now our average yield is uh, a little bit low because uh, we need some funds to the fence some lands and grow some cattle fodder which we are planning now if we can increase their green fodder we will increase the yield up to maybe 8 to 12 liters which is a sustainable yield for our semi-arid regions so this is where sustainability is very important some people say you have to have 15 liters 20 liters per cow so but uh, as for the university recommendation as from our own practice we have seen if you are getting less than 8 liters you are losing it is not sustainable and if you are going about 12 13 also it's not sustainable so if for our agroclimatic conditions 8 to 12 is sustainable because you may get 15 or 20 liters but you have to have cooling air you have to have sprinklers you have to use electricity you have to use more water and you have to use antibiotics and so all these things are there so it is not about the exact liters per cow so it is what you can get sustainably and without damaging the environment, that is also very important. So now we are in the process of developing and increasing the herd now. Uh, these are some of the finger millets in our common area field. And once a year in July, we, whatever is uh, available in that particular time, the third week of July, we harvest all the farm produce, all the will, all the vegetables, everything, we gather it in our chapel and we give uh, thanks to the God for uh, blessing us with the bounty of the natural resources. Then we share all the produce with our workmen, all the village people who work for us. So this is the picture of the uh, farm produce, which is uh, in, inside our church. So when sir was talking about digitalization and management everything i think that's the real need of the hour we can see we cannot blame climate or weather or anything we have to accept what is reality and we have to adapt to those situations so this is once against our idolatries of the mind and spirit we don't want to be greedy we don't want to have ingratitude but at the same time we don't want to solely depend on our own ideas also so we can depend on science but at the same time we have to respect our emotions also and our culture also so and this is also we have learned so when we are successful oh we have learned everything this is the end no it is not like that we have to constantly learn and there is more value in questioning than in absolutes that we have learned so we are always open to learn, always open to adopt new technologies and new breakthroughs. So this attitude is very important, in especially in rain-fed and climate-resilient farming because new data is pouring in and new technology is coming in. So you have to be always in a learning mode. And this is, uh, this is also very, very important. So we always try to embrace the insights of contemporary science and strive to protect the earth ensure its integrity and sustainability this uh, this is the underlying thread of whatever we do so we try to do things simply and sustainably and uh, this is the thing which drives us and these are some of our children from our orphanage they are walking through our paddy fields in our common area <laughs> so sir you can see this <laughs> yes, yes this is the common area field yes Children are enjoying, they are learning about tadpoles, frogs, and different water birds, snakes. Because we do organic, we see all sorts of insects in our paddy field. They come there to learn those things. 
So I think with this, I end my session. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think you are muted. Hmm. Then come out from the presentation mode. Thank you very much. And uh, 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 Dr. Vengdesh Varlo, you are on the connectivity. Oh, you got it disconnected. Hmm. No. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, good afternoon. Just one minute. Good afternoon. Just one minute. And um, I will also ask uh, his joint. Uh, made Dr. Jeremiah Rajanation is the CEO of Donor Fellowship and he made a very nice presentation. I'm very happy. And on smart tribal for it's smart rainfall farming. First talk was given by you know Dr. VK Singh, director of the CRADA, and this is second talk. And and that talk also you are supposed to be given, but uh, you have passed on that uh, you know request to your director. Then I was remembering that I should request you to participate. Thank you very much. And you listened to the talk by Mr. Jeremiah Rajanation. And I would like to hear from you as to how to go further. He has also given what they are doing for the last 123 years. And I have seen from my young childhood. I was born and brought up in very near to this place. We have seen it. And uh, I thought that it's a good experiment. There is a rural reference model, how we can take it up further. I would like to hear from you, uh, Dr. Vengdeshwar Varli Garu. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Moni, uh, for inviting for this. And I, I enjoyed the presentation of Dr. Rajnishan. And uh, particularly, you know, the 100 year experience, you know, normally we don't see that kind of long. Uh, record of data and then uh, you know consistent uh, efforts for such a long time and uh, <clears throat> of course many of the points he mentioned uh, they are in fact uh, in discussion very much in the government system even globally also like you know a cyclic way of resource using then regenerative farming local sourcing of food all these things are now uh, very much in the agenda of the global community and also even in India also. Uh, the, the only uh, point is that uh, given our uh, uh, population in this country, of course, whatever he does, absolutely fine for a local area as an experiment in a, a cluster of villages or in a, in a big village or in even a block also. Only thing is when you take the national view, of course, there are some limitations, obviously, because last year, if you see, we had about 5 million tons loss of wheat when there was a heat wave in Punjab, you know, about 5 degree more temperature for one week. As a result, in 2022, Rabi, India lost about 5 million tons of wheat. And the government immediately responded by banning export of wheat. And you know how much uh, hue and cry in the global uh, you know, discussion that, you know, India, why should India ban uh, wheat export as a result to how African countries, you know, they are depending on India, how they will survive. So all that. So food uh, uh, self-sufficiency is a very tricky and, uh, you know, important issue for the country as a whole. So we really cannot play with that uh, at any time. Uh, so while having said that, there is no denying the fact that uh, we have to go in this direction of sustainable agriculture, trying to you know minimize the external input use, trying to rejuvenate our soil, trying to protect water resources, whether they are from springs or watersheds or lakes, uh, rivers, whatever it is. So that that on that I think again there is anonymity. The only question is how to do it and uh, how to involve the community and how to do it in a cost-effective way. Whether only the government should go on doing and by investing money, by launching new and new schemes, or it should be coming from a bottom-up approach like you are doing, you know, involving community and then, you know, uh, uh, awareness creating so that water resources are, uh, you just, uh, if you travel by train, you don't see so much on plane, but if you travel by train, you will see, it's a very, you know, we have grown up, I am 70 now, exactly 71, 
um, I have seen, you know, how the rivers were so clean, even my childhood, whether you take Krishna, Godavari, Yamuna, any river, if you, when the train crosses the river, you see so much plastic waste, so much of, you know, biomass clogging the rivers and so much eutrophication. So it really pains, not only rivers, even the village tanks, you know, all reservoirs, it's very painful. So to that extent, I think we need to uh, uh, bring this awareness to protect our water resources. Absolutely, there is no second opinion on that. And for that to happen, uh, we need to change the way we do our agriculture. We need to use the inputs. We cannot suddenly stop the input use like fertilizer, pesticides, but we can definitely rationalize the use and to some extent uh, use it uh, very prudently so that the excess fertilizers, nutrients, etc. don't go into the runoff and damage the water resources. That is one, I think, very important uh, organizations like you. Um, they, you must focus and you are already doing that. And secondly, you know, the real, uh, although when I, when I heard this title, uh, I was uh, expecting something, you'll we'll talk about the real rain for agriculture, but uh, this is more you are in a very transition kind of, you know, between Western Ghats and the, uh, you know, plain area. So that's a very unique uh, ecosystem. But the real dry land you will find in a place like Kovilpati in Tamil Nadu. You know, we, uh, the, we, there we have our Krida as a regional station. A hundred years ago, the Britishers again started that Kovilpati research station. That's the true, you know, rain fed, uh, uh, that whole Tamil Nadu, Kovilpati, then Pudukotta, you know, that whole area in Tamil Nadu, uh, which again depends on northeast monsoon, but they also get some rains during southwest monsoon. So, and then the entire Maharashtra area, Vidarbha, and then Karnataka, North Karnataka, Telangana, Rayal Sima, uh, Saurashtra, and Eastern Rajasthan. These are the true dry lands where the real problems uh, people have to play with and people have to face. But anyway, even your case also, you are telling about 30 inches rainfall. So it's uh, 800 millimeters. It's also low, but you have an assured rainfall. Looks like, you know, the way you are telling the 100 year data which you have shown. Um, it's definitely, it's a very good, you know, rainfall consistently for over 100 years. And what you said about the total rainfall not being changing and only the rainy days are changing, intense rains, that is exactly same all over India. All over India, we are observing the same trend. The number of rainy days are decreasing, intense rainfall events are uh, increasing and the total rainfall remaining more or less same. And let me tell you that most of the global as well as Indian climate predictions indicate that in future we will have even more rainfall than today, even total rainfall. Yeah. But the problem will be that the total water requirement for the crops will increase because of the temperature rise, because of the increase in ET demand. So therefore, in future, although we may have more rain, but still we will face difficulty because our water requirement will increase. The demand for irrigation will increase. So therefore, as you rightly said, uh, if you have more rain, it is very important to have a soil cover to protect the soil from erosion, uh, from excess flooding and uh, more cyclones. All these uh, important issues will uh, maybe the... So it's very important, not that uh, we will have any solutions during our lifetime, but bringing this awareness among small kids, children is very important so that next 30, 40 years, they'll be able to face these issues and perhaps they will even come out with some out-of-box solutions. Uh, and uh, finally, in, in rainfed agriculture, there is one mantra which is important is Dr. Vengadeshwarlu. So all that will be welcome. So no, with that, I... Uh, Dr. Varluji, we have last uh, one minute connection. You have to repeat it, what you yeah, said. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So what I said is that, you know, all this uh, marrying the digital agriculture with rainfoot agriculture, I think is the very much required. And what you poop both of you have mentioned that and I think uh, I really enjoyed the lecture and thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Moni. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Venkateshwar Luji. And I also would like to network with Kreda.
with this project, you know, that which Donor Fellowship is doing it and uh, how to bring it out. And uh, let me also, you can also give your thought process, maybe put it in the, I'll form a separate WhatsApp group with respect to this experimentation. So we can do that. Sure. It will be very nice. And now you heard uh, Dr. Vengadeshwarlu's observation. Uh, over yes. to uh, Mr. Zeramia. You please, uh, you know, uh, respond with respect to what you have, uh, you know, heard from him. He is one yes, of sir. the well recognized, distinguished, you know, the scientists in this area. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, you were spot on saying that uh, actually we can afford to do this kind of experimentation because we are a small community and maybe we have a small sphere of influence. We can do that. But when we, but this cannot be replicated everywhere. So in each area, people have to find, contextualize their own solutions. And uh, we are doing our best in our area, how we can do that. And we are also trying to impact the children as much as possible. So we'd be very happy to have, if you have any uh, curriculum or any syllabus for small children, for climate change and other things, I think we'll be happy to have that. If you have uh, anything like that for, so we can uh, incorporate that in our schools. So, and as an NGO, we can also go and uh, spread these messages in the schools around our area. Also, that also we will do. Thank you. Very okay, much. there is a lot of material I'll share with you. I mean, you can send your email. Yes, and you yes. can contact me. I will send you a lot of material in there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vengadeshwar Luzi. And you know, you thought that you wanted to leave by one o'clock. I think it's at that time and one o'clock. And uh, thank you very much. And we will interact. And uh, I will also request you can, you know, will it be possible for Kreda, uh, your Koelpati uh, regional station to visit and make a, a, a study report on this experimentation which Donor Fellowship is doing it? No, you have muted. You have muted. You can contact the local chief scientist because I have retired, so I don't know the exact name right now who is heading the station. But if you... I, I, uh, if you yeah, if you contact the him, they'll be pleased to help you. They have 100 year experience. Very nice, sir. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thanks. And okay. uh, it is very important. And Mr. Jeremiah, is there any other people who have joined? Mr. Manish, can you put them online? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, Vanakam Nalla Sivan. Yeah, Nalla Sivan. வணக்கம் <laughs> 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 No, we had a very fantastic presentation by Mr. Zaramaya Rajanayashan and also the observation made by Dr. Vengdesh Rulu, former director of CREDA ICER. And it is a very good experiment. And Ayan Allah Sivan, Kekradam, hello. Mr. Jaramaya. Can you put your video on? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, that, you know, just to interact with him. Mr. Jeremiah, unmute Unga mic. Subramaniam. வெளிநாட்டுல இருந்தும் காய்கறி விதைகள் மத்த நெல் விதைகள் எல்லாம் இறக்குமதி பண்ணாங்க 
இறக்குமதி பண்ணி இங்க விவசாயம் பண்ணும் போது அதுல பூச்சி தொல்லைகள் வந்து அப்புறம் மறுபடியும் அவங்க கிட்டே போய் மருந்துகள் எல்லாம் வாங்கி திரும்பி அதை இது பண்ணி இப்ப திரும்பி 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 விவசாயிகளுக்கு செலவு மேல செலவாகி நிறைய விவசாயிகள் தமிழ்நாட்டுல தற்கொலை பண்ணிட்டாங்க அது பாதி பேப்பர்ல வராமலே போயிட்டு அதுக்கப்புறம் அந்த பஞ்ச வந்து தண்ணி வறட்சி வந்த உடனே இந்த சுத்து கிராமத்து மக்கள் எல்லாம் கிணறுகள் எல்லாம் ரொம்ப ஆழப்படுத்த ஆரம்பிச்சுட்டாங்க ஆழப்படுத்தி நூறு அடி நூத்தம்பது அடி கிணறே தோண்டிட்டாங்க அப்புறம் பெரிய பெரிய ராட்சஸ போர்வெல் வண்டி வந்தது அதை வச்சு எண்ணூறு அடி தொள்ளாயிரம் அடி வர போர் போட ஆரம்பிச்சுட்டாங்க ஆக கிரவுண்ட் வாட்டரே காலி பண்ணிட்டாங்க விவசாயிகள் பூரா அப்ப நாங்க டோனா ஊர்ல இயற்கை பாதுகாக்கணுங்கிறதுக்காண்டி எதுவுமே கிணறையும் டீப்பனிங் பண்ணல போரையும் தணிக்கல அப்படியே என்ன சென்று இருக்கும் போதா மிஸ்டர் ஜெரிமையா வந்தாங்க அவங்க வந்துதான் இந்த மழைநீர் ஹார்வெஸ்டிங்க முதல்ல அறிமுகப்படுத்தி இங்க டோனா ஊர்ல அஹ் முதல் வருஷம் பார்த்தாங்க மறு வருஷம் உடனே மழைநீரை ஹார்வெஸ்டிங் பண்ணிட்டாங்க அது நாங்க எங்க இடத்துல உள்ள தண்ணி எந்த தண்ணியுமே வெளியில கொண்டு போகாம எங்க கிணத்துல ஸ்டோர் பண்ண உடனே எங்க நிலத்தடி நீர் ஆட்டோமேட்டிக்காவே மேல உயர ஆரம்பிச்சுட்டு அப்புறம் அது போக மரங்களை நிறைய இன்ட்ரடியூஸ் பண்ணாங்க இந்தியால என்னென்ன மரங்கள் எல்லாம் இருக்கோ வெளிநாட்டு மரங்கள் கூட எங்க இடத்துல நடந்துக்கு அங்க எங்க சீடெல்லாம் கலெக்ட் பண்ணிட்டு வந்து நாங்களே நர்சரி போட்டு அத உற்பத்தி பண்ணி எங்க காம்ப்ளக்ஸ் பூரா நிறைய மரங்கள் லட்சக்கணக்கான மரங்களை நட்டோம் அப்புறம் பக்கத்தில் உள்ளவங்களுக்குமே அந்த மரங்களை இலவசமா கொடுத்து அவங்களையும் நட வச்சோம் நாங்க நிறைய மரங்கள் நட்டதுனால என்னன்னா எங்களுக்கு மழை மற்றவங்களை விட கூட கிடைச்சிருக்கு எங்களுக்கு ஒரு நாலு கிலோமீட்டருக்கு அங்க பிஞ்ச மழைய விட எங்க இடத்துல மழை வந்து எப்படியும் பத்து மில்லிமீட்டரு அஞ்சு மில்லிமீட்டர் கூடியதான் பிஞ்சிட்டு இருக்கும் ஒவ்வொரு டைமும் மொத்தத்திலயும் கூட மழை பெய்யும் இந்த மாதிரி சூழ்நிலையில இது எல்லாம் அது போக எங்க இடத்துல இந்த உயிர் வேலிகளை நாங்க இன்னும் அப்படி வச்சிட்டு இருக்கோம் இதனால என்னன்னா பாம்பு முயல் முள்ள இந்த நிறைய சிறு சிறு உயிரினங்கள் நல்ல எங்க இடத்துல வாழ்ந்துட்டு இருக்கு நிம்மதியா வாழ்ந்துட்டு இருக்கு இப்ப இது எங்க இடம் நூத்தி இருபது வருஷம் நூத்தி இருபது வருஷம் ஆனாலும் கூட இன்னைக்கு வேற பாம்பு கடிச்சு எந்த விதமான ஆக்சிடென்ட்டுமே வந்தது கிடையாது ஆனா பாம்புகள் நிறைய இருக்கு ஐயா வந்து பாம்பு எந்த பாம்பையும் நாங்க அடிக்க மாட்டோம் எடுத்து அனுப்பி விட்டுறோம் பட்டு எதுவரை எந்த ஆளுமே பாம்பு கடிச்சதோ எந்த சின்ன அவர் ஆக்சிடென்ட் கூட இதுவரை நடக்கல அதே மாதிரி ஃபாரஸ்ட் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட்ல எங்க அம்மா மாதிரி பிள்ளைமா பிள்ளைகள் எல்லாம் போகும்போது கூட யானைகள் சிறுத்தைகள் எல்லா மிருகங்களும் இருக்கு ஆனா இதுவரை எங்களுக்கு எந்த விதமான ஒரு விபத்துகளும் அதுல நடக்கல அதனால நாங்க இயற்கையை நேசிச்சு வர்றதுனால அந்த இயற்கை எங்களுக்கு ஒத்துழைக்கோ என்னமோ அது அது எனக்கு தெரியல பட் நாங்க எங்க கண் கூட பார்த்தது என்னடான்னா இந்த மழை நீர் சேகரிச்சதுனால கிணத்தடி நீர் உயர்ந்தது நாங்க இன்னும் போற தணிக்கவே இல்லை கிணறையும் தணிக்கல அதே மாதிரி விவசாயமும் நாங்க இந்த ஹைபிரிடு அந்த வெளிநாட்டு விதைகளை யூஸ் பண்ணாம நம்ம நாட்டு ரகங்களே போட்டு வந்ததுனால எங்களுக்கு ஓரளவு நாங்க இயற்கையிலே அந்த இயற்கை விவசாயமே பண்ணிட்டு பூச்சிக்கொல்லி இந்த மாதிரி பூச்சிக்கொல்லி இதெல்லாம் உபயோகிக்காம நம்ம இயற்கை வழியிலேயே அதை கட்டுப்படுத்தி விடுதோம் அப்புறம் மண்புழு வளர்க்கனால எங்களுக்கு மண்புழு உரங்கள் கிடைக்கும் அப்புறம் எங்க மரங்கள்ல விழுத கொலைகள் எதுவுமே நாங்க தீய போட்டு எரிக்க வைக்கவே எதுவுமே கிடையாது அங்கங்க விழுத இடங்கள் அப்படியே அங்கேயே மல்சிங் பண்ணிடுவோம் அதனால எங்களுக்கு இந்த மண்ணு நல்ல வளப்பட்டுட்டு அதனால எங்களுக்கு செயற்கை உரம் போட வேண்டிய அவசியமும் இல்லை எங்களுக்கு ஈல்டுகள்லாம் நல்லாதான் இருந்துட்டு இருக்கு இது வரை விஷம் இல்லாத சாப்பாடு சாப்பிட்டங்கிற ஒரு நிம்மதியில எங்க பிள்ளைகளுக்கு சாப்பாடு கொடுக்கும் அது போக எங்கிட்ட மீதியா இருக்கிறத வேலை விவசாய மக்க சுற்று வட்டாரத்துல உள்ள மக்களுக்கும் ஒவ்வொரு வாரமும் ஃப்ரீயா இந்த பெருசி புதங்களை மண்ணைக்கு அவங்களுக்கு கொஞ்சம் ஃப்ரீயா தானியங்கள் கொடுப்போம் எங்கிட்ட விளைஞ்ச தானியங்களை கொஞ்சம் ஃப்ரீயா கொடுப்போம் இப்படி எல்லாம் சேவை பண்ணிட்டு இருக்கேன் ஐயா முக்கியமா ஐயா வந்த பிறகு ஜெரி ஐயா வந்த பிறகு இந்த மழைநீர் சேகரிப்பு ஒரு விழிப்புணர்வு வந்தது அப்புறம் அந்த மரம் நடந்தது இங்க லோக்கல்ல மக்களுக்கு தெரியாது இப்ப எங்க எங்க இடத்துல இல்லாத மரங்களே இல்லை மேக்சிமம் இந்த உத்திராட்சம் அப்புறம் இந்த என்ன சொல்லுவாங்க நிறைய மரங்கள் நிறைய இந்தியாவில என்னென்ன மரங்கள்லாம் இருக்கு எல்லா மரமும் எங்ககிட்ட இருக்கு ஐயா அது மாதிரி ஐயா வந்த பிறகு அதை உள்ள நாங்க டெவலப் பண்ணணும் அதனால நிம்மதியா இயற்கையோடு சேர்ந்து வாழ்ந்துட்டு இருக்கோம் ஐயா நன்றி நன்றி வணக்கம் ஃபார் தி பெனிஃபிட் ஆஃப் தி ஆடியன்ஸ் ஐ எம் வெரி ஹாப்பி டு யூனோ இன்ட்ரடியூஸ் மிஸ்டர் நல்ல சிவன் ஃப்ரம் கோயலமாள் ஃப்ரம் வில்லேஜ் ஐ வாஸ் பார்ன் இன் வெரி நியர் டு கோயலமாள் ஃப்ரம் வில்லேஜ் தட
1970 batch SSLC. And, uh, and now after retiring as a Director General National Informatics Center, Government of India, I'm settled in Delhi. And uh, this program, and I was the man who brought IT and agriculture in a very big manner when I was in service. And this university, Soviet Institute of Engineering Technology is the first university in the country to have a center for agricultural informatics and e-governance research studies to promote technology. And we also launched a MTech in agricultural informatics program for engineering students and non-engineering students to promote technology in agriculture. I was involved in for the last 35 years in government to bring in technology in a very big manner from 1987 onwards to bring in digital technology in, in uh, 512 districts during the period of Mr. Rajiv Gandhi when he was the prime minister. And then from 95 onwards, I was involved in bringing IT in agriculture. Many schemes were due to my uh, you know, visualization. And now during the, you know, our honorable pr prime minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi has established doubling farmers income by 2022 committee that is popularly known as Dr. Ashok Dalwai committee. And I was part of that committee. I chaired the two subgroups, volume 11 and volume 12B. Volume 11 is on empowering farmers through agriculture ext extension technology and ICT. And volume 12B is digital technology in agriculture. So we are trying to promote agri-tech startup in every gram panchayat. And uh, since I was born and brought up in that area, I now, as a son of the soil, I wanted to bring a lot of technology to area. And uh, and today is the 113th edition, Smart Rainford Farming. And uh, we're also trying to bring in, I have been talking to the uh, district administration, and we also established a Center for Agricultural Informatics in KP Institute of Technology, Levanjibro, Tunnel Valley District. And we are trying to bring in banana value chain, and, and uh, many horticulture products value chain, paddy value chain, and many other things. And uh, it, with the help of, uh, uh, in association with um, Donauer Fellowship, we will try to bring in, you know, complete digital transformation of agriculture in, in Tunnel Valley District, and especially in Kalakad Panchayat Union. And agriculture is a one area which can bring enough entrepreneurship employment opportunity to the rural boys and girls and uh yeah when i come from you know mahilchi and uh uh koyala malpuram uh in the park i'm quite a lot of you know you know 74 you know that you know in an entire area, I don't know. Where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? opposite the school. Yes, that's right. Very nice. That we are trying to have common area, that water body as a main one. Oh. And I have discussed with uh, Mr. Jaramayam. Let us do what we can do that. Let us bring digital technology in agriculture, taking Kalakadu Panchayat Union farmers as a model mm -hmm. with the help of Donauer Fellowship. And I was quite impressed the way in which the development work has been done. That's why I invited a senior scientist from Indian Council of Agriculture Research from Center for uh, Central Research Institute in Dryland Agriculture, Hyderabad, to join. Mm -hmm. And it is a very big experiment which uh, Donauer Fellowship has done it. It is, it is it's my responsibility to take this achievement to the national level and also international level through the Soviet Institute of Engineering Technology Center for Agriculture Informatics and, uh, 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 and E-Governor Research Studies, Center for Agribusiness and Disaster Management Studies, Center for Informatics Development Solutions and Application, and Center for Industry 4.0 Technology Studies and Application, and Center for Health Informatics and Computing. And, uh, and uh, you know, the whole, rec you know, this is a live telecast I'll be very happy that Mr. Jeremiah, you know, this link will be made available to you and you yeah. make it available to your team. And let us make it when next time when I visit Trinal Valley, I will certainly will come to Donor Fellowship and sure. stay with you for one day 
and in fact with the you know the boys and girls and the sisters and brothers and mr anand anand stra is my classmate you know we studied together and uh, together and uh, still we have contact and uh, it is let us take this uh, you know the thread further and i want to see that you know that digital agriculture system in tinal valley district is well developed through the model project that is very important and also we will establish center for and through the cape institute of technology and i'm also an advisor and they also yeah, established cape green mission and we will also you know that you know i'll be visiting malaysia maybe mm-hmm. november 30th to Dece- december 4th to participate in the global organization of pe- uh, people of indian origin to okay. make a presentation on cape green mission Mm-hmm. and let us take it as a model one let us don our fellowship and keep instead of technology levanchipuram and the sopit instead of engineering technology dimt university based in uh, in meerut and this is the only university to have you know t- you know center for agricultural informatics and governance given the need for technology in agriculture not even iits not even nit not even many engineering colleges have given that much importance for it in agriculture and i i would like to uh, you know th- you know i would like to you know give my you know uh, you know uh, you know my my you know homage to the the the, the you know we used to call you know uh, miss amma in those days in english <laughs> days and uh, and uh, you know it is it is it is a that fond reference reverence yes. and uh, and it has and i felt so happy that i wanted to talk to you for the last two years i was not able to get you a number many people when i ask that you know it is and finally i got it and for the last one month we worked together today we were able to have you know a fantastic baby, you know presentation talk you made it and <laughs> this talk also will go to the member agriculture niti ayog dr ramesh chand and also mm-hmm. agriculture ministry and okay. also prime minister's office and you know this is a link goes from the university and i am very happy for having this wonderful presentation an experiment which is happening at the grassroots level for the last 123 years and uh, this has to be you know as a as a diploma course which we would like to do it in the university to train the boys and girls based on the experiment which you are doing you know during the last 123 years Yes. and which is also recognized by dr venkatesh varlu and i will also talk to the creda station you know in koilpetti next time when i come down let us also go there and we'll also ask the scientists to go and visit and make yes. a, a report by icar yes. and i also will will you can prepare a project proposal on spot rainford farming okay you have already established it how to bring in technology how to bring in you know that you know this is a, you know you know productivity increase and also establishing value chain the six mission, seven mission mode programs which we talked about digital technology in agriculture how this can be operationalized and yes. in, uh, in in your uh, agriculture uh, resources and bring in total digitalization yes. you have you know i i'm very happy that you know you are working in the area of child development education health care yes. and community development and conservation of nature and this is a holistic development yes. has to be you know you know made available to the younger generation yes. and also through diploma courses yes. on smart rainford farming yes. and uh, we will also network with the national rainford area authority so and i would like to have uh, more information on the smart rainford farming and e governance uh, if you can send me some material i'll i will we'll form a separate group i will also post yes. it and we'll grow it let you be the yes. nodal agency to bring it out smart rainford farming yes. Yes. it is an institution with more than 123 years i know personally you know that you know uh, you know uh, i know about this organization and we should bring it out because india has to get to benefit out of this experiments which are happening at the grassroots level yes Yes, yes. and uh, that is that's why today and thanks to our honorable chancellor he is also coming from the 
tri, you know, the agriculture community. This is a third generation who run okay. the educational institution. They run two universities, mm -hmm. you know, in the western part of Uttar Pradesh. Okay. And, uh, and uh, they invited me as a visiting professor when I was the Deputy Director General National Informatics Center in 2008. And afterwards mm -hmm. is no, you know, you know, looking back. In 2013, when I retired as Director General in National Informatics Center, they, uh, the Chancellor invited me to join as a Professor Emeritus and we have established five centers and I'm the chairman of the, those, you know, center of excellence. And, uh, and I also would like to make a small, you know, that, you know, the activities which you are doing, Don Our Fellowship is doing for the last, you know, 123 years, we would like to bring it out as a center of excellence on smart rainfed farming. Yes. You know, and I say, said it in my remarks that since our Honorable President, Her Excellency yes. Thropati Murmu is mm -hmm. from the tribal community. Yes. So I thought that it is my responsibility to, you know, operationalize one component, smart tribal farming. Mm -hmm. In a cluster of 10 tribal villages from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and from Assam to, you know, Gujarat and including the district where from our Honorable President comes from in Murisa, Mayurbanj district. And uh, and there is no value chain anywhere. Yes. And uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the same manner, in Tamil Nadu also, I'm getting a very good support. We have identified 36 villages in Coimbatore, mm -hmm. even though 36 kilometers away from, uh, you know, that, you know, Coimbatore main city, but the tribals are tribals. They, the technology has not reached there. Yes. And then Jawad Hills, you know, that, you know, it is Malayali tribes. Christ. And a lot of agriculture, there is no value chain. Yes. And then, and when this I discussed with the tribal welfare director, he's very high quartered person. He said that, Professor Moni, you know, you would like to bring in a sustainable uh, livelihood opportunity on, based on the land which the tribal has it. Mm -hmm. So we will support you. Please uh, submit the project proposal. We will yes. forward to the <laughs> Ministry of Tribal Affairs. And then he also said it, please also you know, work in Koli Hills, Kalrayan Hills, mm -hmm. and also work out Kani tribes in Tunnel Valley and uh, Kanyak. Mm -hmm. And uh, even Tunnel Valley District Administration, Mr. Kokal, the former IAS mm -hmm. officer, you know, he was assistant collector. He talked mm -hmm. to me and we are next time when I visit Tunnel mm -hmm. Valley, I will also visit. There are about 22, uh, 22 to 46 tribal villages are there in, in Tunnel Valley District. Yes, yes. And uh, and uh, we have to document the tribals how they use you know ethno veterinary ethno ethno veterinary medicines and ethno botanical studies and so they use it for various you know their own uh, healing process and so on and so forth medical proper uh, practices we should understand so thank you know many commodities you can uh, work out you know a project proposal we will discuss. Yes. And all the commodities which are growing in Kathanal Valley District, especially Kanya, you know, Kalakad Panchayat Union, yes. should have value added products, should yes. go to direct farmer to customer. Yes. And with the traceability with the blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. And with your support, since you also have a health, you know, care, we will yes. also see to that use of artificial intelligence, blockchain, yes. blockchain technology and mm -hmm. data analytics to ensure optimal nutrition in the soil mm -hmm. and also harvested food to minimize human disease. Yes. This is a very important thing. And also we'll network all the engineering colleges like Cap Institute of Technology mm -hmm. with the lead, you know, inst you know, initiative to bring yes. in this aspect. So let yes. us work together. And uh, I, I'm very happy to remember and, uh, you know, Amma, Ami Karmaikel, formerly yes. known as Amma. Yes. And for establishing such a wonderful institution, yes. and uh, you know this, uh, you know, uh, has to be brought to the notice of the central government, yes. and it is very important. And uh, and uh, I'm very happy that your presentation included soil conservation, rainwater harvesting, sustainable agriculture, flora fauna conservation, and mitigating carbon footprint, living and construction. But some of the things which you put it, I felt very happy, noted down, holistic development, sustainable library, livelihoods, by and and reference, reverence to lives, yes. live, living organisms. Yes. And 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 then 
the best practices and the documentation which the uh, the members of the you know donor fellowship has documented i think it will be digitalized it should be digitalized we should brought it back and then he also said that sacred circle of life and it is very important and then you know the you know that you know you brought out a very nice hypothesis modern agriculture is linear input output system and it is a striking statement which you made it and you know this we hope that you know all you know agricultural university understand this terminology and also you said it our food system is an extraction industry yes. so this has to be reversed and you know you said it that you know you connected a very good you know a value chain you know plant and animal human and soil you know yes. that you know is very important value chain and uh, you know this is is an important thing above all i was quite you know you know happy and also the in depth knowledge which you built it the donor fellowship has built it on rain water rain fall data you know analysis and it is it is one of the highest active you know research area which mm-hmm. you are able to do that i will also network your yeah, activities with the imd delhi mm-hmm. you know that you know we'll we'll we will network with the uh, indian meteorological department that the type of activities uh, don our fellowship as an ngo is doing it mm-hmm. with this i thank you uh, anybody else is joined from your side you know except mr alasivan i am no okay thank you very much we had a presentation webinar normally it used to be for 1 hour 30 minutes today it has come to 1 hour 1 hour, 1 hour 56 minutes Okay. thanks to god thanks to our people thanks to all the institutions which uh, has done it i think mr he is the secretary Deva, uh, of donor fellowship he would like yeah, to vanakka, say when i come for the benefits of the pa- participants through the throughout the country you can start with tamil and end with english over to you hey yes sir so we are very much pleased we never expected that uh, we'll get a call from you and we were especially in donor fellowship we are very passionate about uh, uh, bringing changes the way in which we do the agriculture and the way in which we do the dairy farming so mr jeremiah rajneshan was the key person in guiding us and uh, leading us in this and he was simply following the legacy of protecting the nature and revering the nature uh, that uh, started by amy carmichael amma so today you gave us a gave a platform for us to bring that out so in a more professional way in a way that we can help other people perhaps from from today onwards it's a new opening i think so thank you for giving us giving us a chance brother sir <laughs> very nice i'm also particularly put it under the banner of uh, uh, you know of african asian rural development organization ardo it is a it is an international organization its headquarters is at delhi it is a mem- uh, organization with 32 member countries 17 african countries and 15 asian countries and uh, it is established in 1960s in india and we work very closely me as per in person as well as also from the sobit university they have signed an moi with the sobit university and this technology i thought that it should go to all the 32 member countries of ardo and the president secretary general his excellency dr manoj narsing dev he is also a, you know from indian origin settled in mauritius and uh, he has also taken lot of interest and i you know as a person at the age of 70 today is my you know happiest day to <laughs> see that how i can be useful to as a son of the soil you know paying back to the society <laughs> and yes. i walked with the bare fruit in all the villages from you know kalakad to you know nahar koil i studied in walker high school and walker high school has given a platform otherwise i would have been a school dropout and i still <laughs> remember for me in the god is you know my mother and the headmaster of uh, you know donor walker high school you know arul uh, uh, you know devadasan ayya you know jasmani you know devadasan it's very important 
and uh, you, you know i studied there and you know i was uh, you know 1970 sslc you know batch thank you very much for joining and let us work together yes, and uh, take this uh, smart rainfed farming based on the rural renaissance model from donor fellowship in a very big manner with this i would like to thank honorable chancellor his excellency secretary general ardo Honorable Vice Chancellor, faculty members, and Mr. Jeremiah Rajanation, Mr. Nalasivan, Mr. Deva Rakhab, and and uh, and uh, Dr. Vengadeshwarlu, and the participants from India and abroad for participating in this program. And it is a very important milestone for us to you know move in the direction of smart rainfed farming, operationalization of digital technology, you know, as recommended by doubling farmers' income by 2022 committee you know in rainford area thank you very much and with this we will close the webinar and leave the studio thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.